Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. Uh, my name is Lauren Gilbert. I'm the Senior Manager for Public Services at the Center for Jewish History, which is the collaborative home for five partner organizations that together form the largest archive of the modern Jewish experience outside of Israel. Uh, thanks to all of you for joining today. Just a few items before we get started. Um, you'll see the chat is disabled for participants, so please put your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, you don't need to raise your hand. Um, we will get to questions at the end, but you can type them in as we go along. Uh, but today's program is being recorded. It will be available on the center's webpage and YouTube page within a few weeks. And since you registered, you'll receive an email with a link to the recording when it's available. Uh, our plan for this afternoon, after a quick introduction, um, our author and I will have a conversation, uh, including a slideshow. After that, we'll go to your questions and we should be all wrapped up within about an hour. Okay, so let me introduce Javier. Um, Javier Sinai is a writer and journalist based in Buenos Aires. His books include Camino al Este, Cuba Stone, and Sangre Joven. His work has appeared in newspapers and publications around the world. He was a South America correspondent for El Universal in Mexico and the editor of Rolling Stone in Argentina. He lives in Buenos Aires, so he is joining us today from New York, where uh, he's on book tour in the US. Uh, the Murders of Moisesville is his first book in English, and it was translated by Robert Kroll. Uh, in your reminder email today, you should have received info about a discount uh, to purchase through the publisher's website, and we will put that link in the chat again today. Um, so if you could join us, Javier. Hello, Lorraine. Hi. Thanks for having me here. Great. Thanks so much for being here. I am going to share the screen with your slides, and then we can start with uh, my questions. Yeah. Uh, from the beginning. OK. All right. So here is the cover of your book. Um, so what I, what I wanted to start out asking you about is really how you got started on the journey of researching and researching and writing this book. Well, it was because of this man we are seeing now here in, in the screen. He's Michael Hakon Sinai. He's my great grandfather and he was a journalist. Uh, he was born in 1877 and he went to Argentina in 1894 with his father, who was a rabbi from Grodno, Belarus, and his family. And when Michal was an old man in 1958, he wrote a memoir, kind of a memoir. It was an article about the first, uh, as we can see here, the first Jewish victims in Moisesville. What is Moisesville? It's a town that was created by uh, Jewish emigres from the Tsarist Empire in the Argentina's Pampas, in the fields of Argentina. Mm -hmm. and it was the first co agricultural colony of Jewish people in Argentina, that, which was like the, the start of a system of almost 20 Jewish colonies uh, that got its peak, its peak, maybe in the 1930s or in the yeah, in the 1930s it was the highest uh, momentum of this system. And okay. I mean, just to end, I mean, why these people were victims? Because between 1889 and 1906, there were there were 22 murders in the colony and this article was the first you learned about that yeah my father found it in the internet and he sent it to me uh and when i read it i i, I was full of questions you know because like why my great grandfather has written about this why these people was murdered why the gauchos who were uh, workers from farm have been have became bandits. Why the Jewish people was coming to going to Argentina 
and one question led to another and led to another and it was why, why, why? Like a mushka of questions. And I love that the book is, is both the history of your family and the colony and these murders, but also really your journey to uncovering this history. You really share how you learned what you learned over the course of your investigations. Yeah, because at that time it was uh, almost 10 years ago, I was working as a crime and justice reporter. So I was very much into this kind of stories, but I wasn't at all into Jewish uh, stories or even less Yiddish stories. Right. I needed to learn a lot of yeah. culture, of language. Yeah and also trace my, my family origins. Well, let's talk a little bit about the, the founder of the colony, who was this guy, um, Maurice de Hirsch. So what did you learn about him? Okay, well, he was a philanthropist. He was a, a banker from, from, from today's Germany. At that time, it was the Prus Prussian Empire and uh, some kingdoms, you know, it was not Germany as it, as it is today, uh, and he lost his two sons, a son and a daughter, so he decided to let his money to the Jewish people, um, uh, and he found, he, he had the biggest philanthropy uh, funds from the late 20th century. Uh, he had made the money by banking and mostly by building the trains of Turkey and some trains of Russia. Uh, and he invested money in the Americas, especially in Argentina and also in Brazil and a little here in the States. So why, why Argentina? I know you compare him to Baron Rothschild, who at the time was funding um, colonies or, um, settlements in Palestine. So why was, why did he choose Argentina? Yeah, it was super interesting, the, the, the discussion, the, argu the argumentation of that time between the, the two barons, you know, the Baron de Hirsch and the Baron Rothschild, because Baron de Hirsch preferred the Americas because Palestine was part of the Ottoman Empire and the Ottoman Empire was in conflict with the Russian Empire, so it was the possibility of a war. And he said, if the Russian Empire invades the Ottoman Empire, it's no sense to move the Jewish people from Ukraine, which is today to Ukraine, at that time it was the Tsarist Empire, to Jerusalem, for example, and then the Tsarist Empire goes, expands to Palestine. So he thought, what it makes really sense was to bring the, the Jewish Russian people, I mean, the Jewish people from Russia, from the Tsarist Empire to the Americas. And by that time, Argentina was mostly like an empty country, a, a, a really big country with few people. So the government needed more people to, to do a, an economic system uh, you know, like more capitalists for the fields, uh, right. cultural capitalist system. So it need more workers. So it was open to, to, to this kind of people that here we see the travel that they did. A lot of people from Europe went to Argentina and there were a lot of agricultural settlements uh, of Jewish people, but also Italian, Swiss people, French people from all over Europe. Mm -hmm. The problem was that the gauchos, the gauchos were the, the classic uh, rural workers of the fields in Argentina, and they were being forced to, to get some discipline because they were nomad people and they were not disciplined at all. So if they didn't want to become like some kind of employees of a farm, it's it's not the correct word employee, but you know, to to work only in a farm for only one one boss. If they didn't want that, they became outlaws and bandits. Mm -hmm. so that's why 
many times they they came to the colonies and they robbed and they killed the people. So this is showing the journey of the first ship that settled Moisesville? Yeah, they came from, as you can see, from Kamenets, Podolsk. That's a region called Podolia. I think in English it must be the same, Podolia. It's mm -hmm. actual day, uh, current day Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And they first went to, they did a very long journey because they went to Paris to, to see if they could go to, actually to Palestine, but they couldn't, so they came back and they finally went to the south to Argentina. Okay. And since it was the murders that really started you on this research process, let's talk about some of those. So is this the latest one? The, the, 1906 yeah. was the last one, right? Yeah, and you know, I, I decided to show you this picture because it's really curious for me because this is taken from a magazine that was called Caras y Caretas and it, it was a, a weekly national magazine, like imagine something like People magazine, so uh, really massive and with, with the massive culture, uh, topics and this was a page it was called the provincias which means from the from the provinces so news from the provinces so for example he said here it says uh, señor luis costa falleció en rawson which means mr luis costa dead in rawson which was a city and in the far right we can see señorita maria alexenitzer which is Miss Maria Alexenitzer murdered in Moisesville. So this is the only picture I could find of, of Miriam Alexenitzer, which was uh, killed by a policeman in 1906 in Moisesville and probably raped, I don't know, but probably she was raped by this policeman uh, and it's, you know, it's unexpected that she's here in, in this magazine. So I guess it was sort of like sensationalistic news at the time. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and this one, what was the story behind this murder? Yeah, so I wanted to show you these people because this, these are the actual victims of these murders. This is Chaim Reitich. Um, this is his tomb in the Jewish cemetery of Moisesville. He was uh, really a big man, like one, I, I don't know in feet, but it's like almost two meters, which is really tall. Uh, and in, in, no, in, in a few years, he could work a lot and have a lot of, of lands for, from his own. And he was killed from the back, so he was stabbed in his back by one of his workers, probably as the memory tale, as the family memory tale says of, of his family, probably after an argument about money. So, so most of these murders, they're, they're over several years and they're not connected to each other. Yeah, right. I know it's not about, um, anti-Semitism, but there is, I think, an element of xenophobia. Mm. Not exactly anti-Semitism, but I think there is xenophobia. And this you said um, in the book is the tomb for the entire family? Yes, there are four people buried here in, in this long tomb. It's the Weissman family, and they were killed all together in the night of July 28, 1897, also by bandits who wanted to rob the house and get the money. And you know, the robberies and the killings um, were not mystery. I mean, the question of the book is not who killed them, like, you know, that's the question in the mystery books or in the Agatha Christie books. But for me, the, the question was why my great grandfather has written about all these killings. So it's another mystery for me. Mm 
No. Uh, and this looks like a, a tomb that has been visited quite a lot, as you can tell by all the stones on it. Yes, and it's it's uh, it's sad and it's strange, but it's this long tomb has become like a touristic landmark in the cemetery. Mm. People says near the long tomb, uh, far away the long tomb. Mm. And so, these are the gauchos you were talking about. Yeah, yeah. These these two, I, I mean, I I have taken this photograph from the National Archive. Probably they are not killers, but these typical gauchos from that time. Mm -hmm. They are like half, uh, half. They are mestizos, you know. They are with some uh, indigenous heritage some Spanish heritage, maybe some African heritage. They are people from the colonial times, from the Spanish colonial times in, in South America, and they are really root in the, in the fields, in the right. agricultural culture. Right. They are people from the provinces. Oh, so you talk a lot about looking for copies of this publication, which was created by your, was it your great grandfather, right? Yeah, because this is another mystery. The book is full of mysteries. So as, as I have told you, my great grandfather has written about the murders when he was an old man in 1958, but he, he, he lived in Moisesville when some of the murders were committed and then he went out and he went to Buenos Aires where he started this newspaper in March 1898. This was the first newspaper in Yiddish in, in Argentina and it was uh, very, very poor. I mean, in, in, the, um, in the production, it was really poor, but it was really a, a, a landmark because it was the first. Yeah, it was interesting to me. You said there was no um, Hebrew language, there was no type, there was no Yiddish um, type to actually make the the uh, newspaper at that time. So how did he put this together? Yeah, that that's why it was really poor. So he 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 needed to do a, an artistic technique that it's called ectography or uh, lithography, which lithography. is handwritten and then um, I don't know the word in English but then you do some handwritten and then it becomes hard and you pre yeah you press it in in each page right so it's like a, it's a print but so it had to be written out by hand and then etched into the stone and printed from there yeah that's it yeah. that's it huh. so this is this that we can see is all uh, all the pages handwritten but I was looking for this news, newspaper because I wanted to check if there was some information about the murders here in this uh, newspaper, but I couldn't find the newspaper because it was uh, archived in the AMIA building. You know, the AMIA is the building of the Jewish community in Argentina, and in 1994 it suffered a, a terrorist attack and a lot of people died, 85 people died. Mm -hmm. well, there were um, 60,000 books, uh, this, no, 40,000 books destroyed and 60,000 books rescued, but this newspaper was missed. Mm. Yeah, I think we have a slide on that, on that coming up. Yes. Uh, but you never found a complete copy of any of the issues of this newspaper, right? Yeah, I so I take I, I have taken this from another book. Hmm. Um, yeah, so you have some images of, of the town back in its in its heyday. Yeah, this is in, in the better days of Moisesville. This is the Kadima Theater, a theater of Yiddish plays. Uh, so these are the good old times of Moisesville. And the, this theater is still used not for Yiddish plays, but for, you know, community meetings or community acts. Mm -hmm. 
for um, school acts for every need. Um, I know I, I had read that in 1970, the town was still 90% Jewish. Do you know what the percentage is today? Well, yes, I've been told it is only 10%. 10%. Mm -hmm. uh, mostly old people, elderly people. Mm -hmm. So yeah, this is another date unknown, but probably the, the 30s, because there were two train lines in Moisesville, and uh, today there is no no line, no train line to Mosesville. Okay, so this is what you were talking about earlier, and um, in that building was Evo, which is, um, not currently affiliated with YIVO with the Center for Jewish History, but they were both offshoots of the original YIVO uh, in Vilna. And um, obviously it was completely destroyed, but you ended up doing a lot of your research at their current location, right? Yeah, because I wanted to show you this special picture because you can see that the building, that there was only one building that was destroyed I mean, imagine the power of that bomb that has taken down a whole building and it was really an inferno, really hell. Uh, and later the Evo uh, established itself in another building, not in the Amia. The Amia was, the building of the Amia was built, built again and now it's a really secure building in that same place and the Evo is in another place. And they did a magnificent work because they could save, as, as we, we can read, 60,000 books of the original 100,000. And I wanted you to talk about this because you go into it quite a lot in the book and I'm not sure how many people know about or remember um, this event in 1994. Um, and you also, um, talk about how many thousands of items have not only not been recatalogued, but they don't even know what's in there yet. They haven't even been inventoried yet, almost 30 years later. It's something, it's incredible. It's, you know, the stories from Borges, which is a great Argentinian writer. He writes uh, about books and libraries and labyrinths, and it's kind of a Borgesian story because they think that today they still got 20,000 books without uh, inventory. Or, I mean, they are in boxes closed uh, to the vacuum, how, how do you say, closed in vacuum? Vacuum sealed or I don't know. Yeah, vacuum sealed. Hmm. From, imagine from 1994 to, to today. Yeah. So, I don't know where, when they will be able to open and take uh, take out what they have um, saved in those boxes. Hmm. There are twenty thousand books. Uh, twenty, yeah, twenty thousand books. So you did a lot of your research there, but the other thing you did um, was try to learn Yiddish. So how did that go? <laughs> yeah, because I didn't know a word of Yiddish, but when I started my research. I, I realized that my some of my most interesting sources were, were memories written in, in Yiddish or history books written in Yiddish from the 30s or from the 40s because there was a lot of Yiddish literary production in Argentina and the Evo uh, still has a lot of books in Yiddish. This is uh, part of the Evo archive in Buenos Aires. Uh, it's a it's a magical place. Uh, it's a little chaos also, but it, you know it's a place where the Yiddish culture is alive, and they teach classes of Yiddish not to speak, but to to read. It's Yiddish for investi for researchers or for investigators, and I took two courses to. To, to classes, I mean, two semesters. So I have learned a lot, not, not to be a fluent reader or a fluent speaker, but at least to do like a filtering. And if I get a book, 
I can read the title and I know if it's useful for me or not. And if it's useful, I take the book to Hannah Powasek, who is a woman that is must my translator. She's the daughter of two Shoah survivors. She lives in Buenos Aires and she has uh, she has been working for me for years doing this research. And I know you're going to be coming to uh, the Center for Jewish History uh, in a week or two to see the um, related collections at YIVO, which, and they have quite a lot of interesting photographs of Moisesville. And the American Jewish Historical Society also at the center has an enormous collection, archival collection related to Baron de Hirsch. So I'm sure there, there's more yeah. things for you to find. Well, while, while, I, while I was doing my research, it was a dream for me to go to the Evo in New York. So it will be next week, it will be a dream come true. Well, we're looking forward the research to that. Team, but I, I still want to go there. Yeah. Um, so and I know you have some pictures from the trips that you've taken while you were doing research for the book. Yeah, this is a, a common people in Mosesville. Uh, as you can see, there's a Magen David in the building behind this man, and that's a Jewish uh, bank, which today is no more a Jewish bank, but it used to be a Jewish Jewish bank. Mm -hmm. It's a, a common place in, in Moisesville. This is maybe the, there are one or two or maybe three restaurants in the whole town. This is one of it. You can see the common people, the workers, they are, uh, there are a lot of, of sons or um, great sons of the famous Jewish gauchos, because at first the gauchos and the Jew immigrants were not friends. I mean, there was the, the murders, there was some xenophobia, but after that, maybe by the 1920s or by the 1930s, there was like cooperation and there was like a fusion of identities and it became a new identity, which was the Jewish gaucho, which was, you know, the Jewish uh, immigrant working in the Argentinian fields. Mm. These are the, these people we can see are the sons or maybe the great sons of, of those immigrants. Now, I, it, it looks like at least the most of the people in this restaurant are older. Is the town population aging or is that just who happens to hang out in the daytime at this restaurant? No, yeah, the young population goes out to bigger cities to study or to work in in other places because Moisesville is uh, 2,500 2, people. So it hasn't got a university and it, it's got not too much work for the people. Mm. I mean, job opportunities. Right. So this is something I, I like a lot, um, that is the um, Festival of Cultural Integration, because, uh, and they name a queen of cultural integration in Moisesville. These three girls are the, the queen and the, um, and the ladies that surround the queen, you know, as in a wedding. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we don't have the names of these girls, but I can remember it was, one was from a Jewish family, another one was from an Italian family, and the other one was from a Spanish family. And what, what I find very interesting is that these towns of, of the provinces in Argentina, they've got like the festival of the soya, the festival of the corn, the festival of the I don't know, the chicken, the festival of the uh, rodeo, you know, with the horses. Mm -hmm. But Moisesville has the festival of the cultural integration, which is really like another level of, of festivals. Yeah. Um, <laughs> you mentioned it's about 10% Jewish now. You, there's a funny quote in the book where you say something like the, the mothers of Moisesville say, um, we, we planted wheat and harvested doctors. You know, pretty yeah, much yeah. everyone moved away. <laughs> yeah, you, that's really Jewish, you know, yeah. because we, we, this is like a, a shared story for, for the descendants of the Jewish immigrants 
here in the States or there in Argentina or where, wherever, that is, we are always looking for education and universities, you know. So, okay, but this man, uh, he was really clever, but he stayed in Moisesville. He never went to, to a big city to study at the university. Uh, however, he was a teacher of accountability and he was my, maybe my, my finest source, you know, he told me a lot of tales and he was the grandson of an immigrant from, uh, from, a, from a shtetl in Belarus, I don't know which one. He was a coin too, as I am. And we became good friends. He passed away in 2016. And well, he was really, um, really curious about the researchers who went to Moisesville. He was called, his name was Abram Kansepolsky. And although he was 80 years old or maybe more, his, his um, nickname was Inge, which means boy. Or kid. So in Moisesville, there are three synagogues. One of those synagogues is a national landmark, but there is no rabbi. So the man who, who is a master of prayer is this man, Luis Liebenbuck. He's, uh, he works with cows. He's a, 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 a rural worker but on every Kabbalah Shabbat, he's there in the synagogue. And you were there for a service? Yeah, he, he conducts the service. And she's Juana Weisman. She was 97 years old when I interviewed, when I met her and I did an interview with her. She was the, the person who was near, nearer to the murders that I could talk with because she was the great granddaughter of one of the victims of, of you know, the long Tom, the mm -hmm. Batman, she was a descendant from that family. Mm -hmm. And this one is the last, this is the entrance to Moisesville. As you can see, it's, um, it's a, a small town, a humble town, uh, and it says Lugar Histórico Nacional, which means National Historic Place, Cuna de la Civilización Judía, uh, which is like origin of the Jewish colonization, Avenida de los Inmigrantes is Avenue of Immigrants. Mm -hmm. So Moisesville is really proud of its origins and that's something i i think it's really interesting and and something we need to like to to make the world know about it about this um so i'm gonna stop screen sharing for a moment um so since it was really the the murders that got you started on this research and why do you think they were so completely forgotten? Because most people didn't know, even in the town, they didn't really know what you were talking about when you asked. Yeah. You know what happened was that um, Argentina is a, is a country of immigrants and the Jewish people were the most exotic, yeah, the most exotic immigrants of all because the country is full of Italian people, of Spanish people, French people, English people, but these Jewish people came from really far away from, of course, the Soviet Empire or even more far away. And to help integrate themselves in society, they didn't want to, to be looked as, as, you know, as exotic. So there is uh, like an official story of the Jewish in Argentina that, that we ourselves, we tell ourselves in, inside the Jewish community that is Argentina opened the arms for us and it was all beautiful and the Jewish came here and 
uh, work the land like in the biblical times. So that was like a cultural necessity to silence this, these murders uh, because of the integration, of the needing of integration. Yeah, so it didn't fit into the narrative that, that people like to tell about the history. Yeah, not to be segregated by ourselves. Um, and you also encountered a lot of myth making in your research. Was it hard for you to separate the myth from the fact? Well, it was really, really difficult. Some in some cases it was impossible. But you know, there was one of my sources, which is Monica Surmuk. She's a scholar on, uh, on Jewish Argentinian literature, and she told me no. Uh, don't lose yourself because the contradictions of, of one story are not, I mean, they don't complicate the story, but they make it re richer, mm -hmm. they make a more interesting story. So look at, look at the complications from that point of view. And she was right because, uh, you know, when with the myths and with the memories from each family, every story has a lot of levels. Mm. There's the, the press articles of that time. So that's, um, that's uh, those are stories more complex and more interesting. Right. Um, so what has, I know the book is only just coming out in English, but it's been out in Argentina for a while. So what has been the response to the book in Argentina or elsewhere in Latin America? In Argentina, it was really interesting because from, from one, in one hand, it had a lot of editions and a, a lot of Argentinian Jewish are descend, me, myself include, included, we are descendants of this uh, Jewish gauchos, so a lot of readers were uh, people whose grandparents or great grandparents were from Moisesville or from another uh, other uh, uh, agricultural colonies. So it was like a little revival for these people, but at the same time, the the book came out in a time when there was a campaign, an official campaign from the government to get back the memory from the 70s, from the 1970s, you know, the political violence, the people who disappear, which is, of course, it's something really good to be made. But at the same time, there is like a, um, like a question that is, what do we want to remember? So who decides what do we want to remember and why remembering the 70s and not the 1890s. So I am not telling that we shouldn't um, we shouldn't recall the, the 70s, but these years of the 1890s, which are so far away and under so uh, so many new memories or, or later memories from that time. Yeah. I mean, we need to get back also to, to that 19th century times. Right. You had mentioned that you were hoping that when the book came out, it would help uncover some copies of your grand, great grandfather's um, newspaper, but it hasn't happened yet, right? Not yet, but I, you know, the the hope is the last one loses. Yeah. The saying in Spanish, I don't know if in English is the no. same. You, you never lost your hope. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how was the translation process? Do you feel like the book in English captures your voice? Yeah, I think it does. The translator is uh, Rob Kroll, Robert Kroll. He has translated some great Argentinian writers for example, Ricardo Piglia, which is one of the greatest of, of these last years. So I am really happy that he was the, the, the one who translated the book. And we did a lot of, of come and go of, of the, of a lot of drafts. And 
as you can see, English is not my mother tongue, but anyway, I could uh, make some comments and and he correct or explain me why he chose uh, some or another word. Right. So I, I think it's okay. It's a, you know, it's not an easy book in, in the sense of you have to pay attention because there's a lot of information and a lot of levels. Right. Um, so I think maybe we'll start as answering some questions from the audience. Um, yeah, this is a question. I have ancestors, my grandmother's relatives who are in Moisesville, as I recently discovered. Is there a way to research genealogy in that area? And I will pose that to you, um, Javier. But first, I just want to say for genealogy questions, in general, um, you can email our genealogy librarians at gi at cjh.org and they can help you. But in terms of specifically to Moisesville, what do you recommend, Javier? Well, there is the Museum of History in Moisesville. Um, you can Google for it and you can write to it because they work on this on genealogy. Okay. Um, and there's a comment about someone whose parents came to the United States to farm in southern New Jersey under the auspices of the Baron de Hirsch Fund. Um, and actually, oh, okay. uh, the um, American Jewish Historical Society, as I mentioned, has the papers um, from uh, the Baron de Hirsch Fund. So we actually get a lot of genealogy researchers looking at the microfilm in our reading room to, you know, to look to see if there's any information about their ancestors that way. Um, but for general research questions about that or other collections, um, I'll give you another email address, which is inquiries at cjh.org. And we can also tell you how to come to the center to look at these collections. Um, here's a question for you, Javier. Did Moisesville have any kind of security police force or other protection, or was it more like the American Wild West? No, you know, the, the, the murders happened uh, in a very big, uh, I mean, there was a, a very big opportunity for the murders for the murders to happen because there was no police and it was much more like uh, Wild West because the thing was that the Argentinian state was going, um, was expanding itself at that time. So it was going northern, western, southern, you know, and when they, they when they went farther and farther, they didn't put police or they didn't put post office or they didn't put um, health hospitals. So they just wanted to expand the borders. So they they got the lands, but the lands were wild mm. so without police the, and that's why because uh, sorry and that's why um the the murders stopped like in nine in 1910 or 1915 something like that because by that time there was police and there was something more uh, you know there was some order in the place I see. And there's a question about whether the article by your great grandfather was written in 1947 or 1958. It was written in 1947. Yeah, no, 68. Maybe I said it, but and, and maybe he died in 1958. He died in 1958. Yeah. OK, so he wrote that article in 1947. And the question was saying that in the book you mentioned it might have been sort of a response to the to the Shoah, like what people had just discovered about the Holocaust. So he was trying to clarify whether it was 1947 or 1958. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, do the Jewish people who live there still speak Yiddish is the question. Well, they don't speak Yiddish every day, but they know a lot of Yiddish sayings and a lot of Yiddish words. And, you know, there is some Yiddish uh, culture in the air. Hmm. There's a comment from someone whose family migrated from Moisesville to Buenos Aires, which, as you said, was, a, I guess, a common path. Super common, yeah. yeah. Um, here's a question about why not send the vacuum packed books to the National Yiddish Book Center or YIVO. I mean, I would just interject there that it's not their 
collections. And I assume Evo in Argentina is planning to eventually get to all of these books and, and recatalog them. Uh, you mean the books from the- uh, The books uh, that, yeah, the books that have not been looked at yet since the bombing. Yeah, they are under the responsibility of the Evo in Argentina, but the Evo hasn't got, uh, hasn't got funds really uh, to do all. There is a lot of work to do and years go by and they work little by little. They are working, but like not so fast. Right. Um, there's a question about Moisesville. Does it still exist as a Jewish agricultural colony? And what happened to all of the Jewish agricultural colonies in Argentina well, from the 1890s? Well, you know, um, this is really interesting is that the, um, the agricultural company of Baron de Hirsch went away from Argentina in 1973. So until 1973, there was this official Jewish presence in these colonies. And after that, the colonies became just small towns from the provinces. Hmm. And um, then Moisesville is a small town. Right. There's a, someone named Diana Goldman is saying that um, her great grandfather was the rabbi that went with the group that founded Moisesville in 1889. His name was Aaron Goldman, and his yeah. and her father was born in Moisesville. Well, uh, Aaron Goldman is really like a, like a, I think the word is a national hero, but not national in Argentina, but. A national hero for for Moisesville is like a George Washington in the Moisesville community. He he was really an important man, and the museum of Moisesville uh, takes the name from him. So it's Museum of Colonization, uh, Rabbi Aaron Goldman. So I am really happy that you Diana are with us today. Yeah, that's great. Um, Here's a question about whether other settlers in the area also came into conflict with the gauchos. Were there murders in the other communities nearby? Yeah, that was really common by that time. And I did a lot of research in the press, you know, in the newspapers from that time and from that province. And it's in, I could read in one article that it said, there's one homicide, one murder, every each uh, every 15 days wow. in the whole province hmm. so there were that's that's why i say that this is not specifically anti-semitic but yes this is something xenophobic hmm. um and a question about the jews who left moisesville and went to buenos aires like what happened to them there well they studied a really big uh, Jewish community and Argentinian Jewish community today is the sixth largest in the world. And uh, for example, today the governor of the province of Buenos Aires, which is like a really, really big and important province in the country, is a Jewish. So a lot of them then went away to Israel or to the States. A lot of them assimilated and lost their Jewishness, like my family and some of us uh, gained back our Jewishness in different ways, mm -hmm. like in a cultural way. So yeah, it's, uh, I think it's very similar to, to what had happened to Jewish people in New York, yeah. like really cosmopolitan culture. Right. Um, a question about whether the Jewish settlements were originally communal, like the kibbutzim. Yeah, it was similar. It was similar. Um, a question about um, the, the Jews resettled um, by Baron de Hirsch in Argentina. Did most of them go to Moisesville? Or you mentioned that there were other colonies as well. No, no, there were like 20 colonies. Moisesville was the first one, but there were a lot of colonies. And Moisesville was um, the most important. And that's why 
it was called as the Jerusalem of South America, but there were like 20 colonies. And what was the total number of murders and in between which years? There were 22 murders between 1889 and 1906. Only uh, Mrs. Vini. Um, and a comment about a, a tour of Buenos Aires to learn about the Jewish population and culture given by Rabbi Ernesto Yate. I don't know if you know who that is, Javier, but no, this sorry, person rec know. recommending that tour. Sorry, I don't know. Um, and uh, Diana responded to say thank you for your kind words, Javier. Thank you. Um, and someone is recommending the book Polacos in Argentina about the Polish Jews who migrated to Argentina. Are you familiar I, with that one? I haven't read it, but a friend of mine recommended it to me and gave it to me. And I have taken a look and it looks really interesting, but I haven't read it yet. It seems like a lot of people joining in today have people who um, who's ancestors sort of traveled this path. Somebody else is saying my yeah, relatives yeah. were Waxenbergs who went from Ukraine to uh, to Moisesville via Baron de Hirsch. So there's a lot of people out here, even in these in the States who You know, who this is the thing that happened in Argentina when the book came out. There is we are a lot of descendants from the colonies. Yeah. I'm happy. Thank you to all. To everyone. All right. Well, that might be a, a good place to end it. <laughs> Um, okay. And let's, you know, let's put in the chat the uh, link with the code for the discount. So anyone who hasn't bought the book and would like to, you can purchase from the publisher there with the discount and free shipping. And I highly recommend it. And there's a lot more information that we didn't get to talk about today. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. And thank you, Javier, for, for coming on today. Thank you, Lorin. It was a great pleasure for me, and I hope we keep in touch. Yeah, and I'll see you at the Center for Jewish History next week. Sure. Okay. Looking forward to it. Thanks. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye.